Today, we're going to be building a way to have a backend API that checks your authentication using a private key. This is sort of a custom auth. We are not rolling our own auth. I do want to be clear, we're not rolling our own auth, but we're going to be using a bit of custom auth to create a backend API where we can read and write data. And we're going to have an API consumer. Now in this case, and I'll be walking through me actually building this feature for Builder.io in a real production code base, which means we're gonna make normal day-to-day -day decisions that are not always glamorous, but hopefully very realistic. And you can see how I do this. Um, the interesting part of this is the request will be made from a Figma plugin. So in the last couple streams, we initiated the process of first, the Figma plugin must authenticate the given user. So the given user needs to be able to um, launch into the Builder app to say, hey, I, I accept giving access, uh, this plugin access to my Builder account. That will then save a key into a database, and then we'll use an API to retrieve that key and save it. Then, once we finish that, so we've built most of that, but now we mostly have to test that out. Then what we're going to do is we're going to create an API where we can read and write data too. I really like to make APIs that are highly reusable, you know, because while in serverless land, it's very easy to deploy backend code, I still find it easier to, to deploy frontend code. More because you never know who's consuming your API, who's consuming your backend. So you need to be much more mindful about changes to a backend interface. Also, personally, I really don't like to have to change things in two places to develop one fix or feature or whatever. I really like to make flexible APIs, very much inspired by, um, um, in my case, like Google Cloud's Firestore or Firebase back in the day, where you really see, you know, you really just want your front end to be able to read and write data. You just need to be secure and performant. And so let's start jumping into some code here. So here I've got my Figma plugin. What I've already done is I've created this login button. Now keep in mind, we are building this and learning as we go. So I've talked about my philosophy on this before. We're not gonna over engineer this. We're not gonna over architect it. We're not even gonna design it in advance. We're gonna reuse our design system. We have this button component already. And then we're going to use that to log us in. And we've already built out the UI here and we've built out the beginnings of the logic here. And also, I'm going to switch to a different space in Builder here as well. I'm going to go over to uh, just a dummy space that I have. And um, I've written the code that should power all this stuff. We're going to test it. And once we validate that our, our authentication works, and then we can do a key exchange and securely pass and store a key in the Figma plugin, then we can start making our requests. Now, for context, why do we even need to save data remotely in our Figma plugin? You might say, hey, the Figma plugin technically can store data client side. Well, what we want to do is we want to be able to export designs to code and we want to be able to use the components from our code base maps to the components in Figma. So when we get the code output and it's all responsive, it's not just divs everywhere. It is buttons, cards, paper, whatever components you have in your code base. In order to do that, we need to run a little bit of AI magic here where we take your design system, um, whatever design system you use, and we allow um, AI to essentially build a blueprint of how we think your Figma components should map to the components of your code. Like this Figma button here should probably become a material UI button for you because you use material UI, or it might become a custom button for you because you wrote your own button components, or you have one you use that is maybe non-standard, it's unique to you. And we want you to be able to allow the AI to kind of create those mapping suggestions, allow the user to edit it because the AI could be wrong, in this case, we actually are saying here that this button goes to our button link component that we have in our code base. Um, this list is dynamically populated from your code. But what we want is for this configuration that we set to always be uh, persistent across people in your space. So the first time ever, we need to start with authentication. And for the first time ever in for Builder's uh, Figma plugin, we need to store data remotely, not just here in the Figma document because your design system configuration should work across documents we want to save it into a place that um, anybody on your team can access. We talked before about how Figma has nothing like that built in, so we need to build it. So let's go through the code here again. So 
we had a situation where the authentication was not as easy as we hoped. We really wanted to just launch the builder app and message back the key, but we can't. We got to go through a backend. So we wrote some polling code. So you can watch this in my last video where we actually explored a couple different ways to poll an API, meaning we don't have a way to send a message back to our Figma plugin. So we need the builder app to write to a place that then the Figma plugin could also poll. And polling we chose here for simplicity as opposed to something like WebSockets because we just need to keep asking until we get an answer. So here's our code when we click our button. On click, we're gonna launch that window. Um, and then as soon as we launch that window, we're gonna start in a while loop. We're going to check uh, up to once every half second. So this is a half second delay we have here. This is a delay function we wrote, pretty simple. And then up to once every half second, we will keep checking until we get a reply. Now, one other thing I'm going to do here is over in the builder app in the CLI auth, I am going to make sure that I'm not actually exposing a private key for testing purposes. Also, because I'm live streaming, I don't want to actually expose any private keys to the internet. So for now, I'm going to skip this get private key logic and I'm going to say private key is foobar. And just because uh, somebody will eventually review this code, I'm going to make sure we say to do haha. <laughs> undo this before merging. We need real private keys. I'm gonna make it loud and annoying so that whoever reviews this code will hopefully, if they do a good job, see this. And if I forgot to uncomment this code and put it back, they will um, point that out and make sure this does not get merged into production. So one thing we can do as well is we can use Postman to test our API. So for those who haven't seen, we did create a Figma plugin auth API. So for those, for those of you that don't use Postman, this, there's another one that's becoming popular lately too, are just very simple API clients where we can just ping an API. Here, you know, you could say, I wanna do a put, maybe I can zoom in on this so it's easier to see on the stream. There we go. You could say, I wanna make a put post get request to this URL, hit send, and then we could see the response. So this is actually a very simple data storage API I made and we're actually gonna take this API and make it authenticated and make it secure so that we can actually use it for this kind of authenticated use case. Insomnia, that's the one I'm thinking of. Um, GrindHQ in the chat, can you tell us why Insomnia is better? The reason why I ask is because I've never used Postman, a very basic HTTP client, and said there's anything I'm missing. Right here inside the client, it's very, very simple. I can give a URL, I can give headers, and then get a response. It's kind of all I'm looking for. So I've never understood why anybody needs anything else, but I am curious by the fact that people, oh, that's my, haha, <laughs> that's my plugin logic. Sorry, you'll see in a minute why that alert just went off. I've never understood why people love Insomnia over Postman, but I would love to know because I'm sure there's a reason. And maybe I should just try it out. Maybe let's just download it. Why not? Insomnia HTTP clients, is that what you'd call it? Collaborative, cool. Here, we'll download this in the background while we continue to do our thing. Oh, wait. I just want to download it. I don't want to have to sign up. Just give it to me. That's one part I like about um, Postman, by the way, is I did not have to sign up. I just hit download and I can start using it. Okay, maybe I won't do this right away. Actually, if it's open source like GitHub, is there not a simple give me the download link? Okay, slightly disappointed I can't just not download a run. We'll try it another time. Um, let's see, everybody seems to say it's lightweight and better for more advanced stuff. I haven't needed advanced stuff or noticed Postman to be heavyweight, but I have definitely switched tools before when I thought I didn't need to and found I like the new one better. Definitely can say that about terminals a lot, so maybe it is the better option. But let's actually test our, our flow here end to end. And so here we wrote some basic logic that I'm refreshing myself on. I'm gonna add a couple logs so I can make sure we're, we're dropping into the places we expected. So I'm gonna say console.log dot private key. So this again is where we're polling we have an API where we're sending a private key to, and then we are then checking to see if we get one. And we do it in annoying uh, alert if we abort. And I think one other thing we actually are doing is we're not disabling this button when we're already loading. So let's do that. Um, so disabled equals loading. This is one silly thing that's very easy to forget to do that when you're hitting a button and you're launching some separate process to go on and you go back here, you shouldn't be able to continue to hit the button, 
Oops, I hadn't hot reloaded, so we need that to kick in, but let's do it again. Let's go over here, let's hit login. And now if I go back, there we go, it's disabled. Now, the, the disabled styling can maybe use some work, but again, we're not worrying about that just yet. We're gonna deal with that later. Um, let's see, Insomnia is better because better. <laughs> Thanks, have a nice day. Thank you, Avad. Um, okay, so the basics of this is working. And so now we need to actually make sure that when we hit authorize, let's double check the code around this. I don't wanna just start hitting buttons before I kind of gave a second look at the code. So if I hit authorize, let's see. A lot of this logic actually doesn't need to run in this circumstance, but that's okay. Request ID should be coming through and then we should be sending this request. So let's actually try this really quickly. So in theory, when I hit authorize, we're going to see in the console a request be made. Oh, look at that. Cool, okay. So I'm just debugging right now and I see it's tried to do the put. This all looks correct. Uh, so we know the right code paths are running. That's a good start, but it's using production. We don't want production because this isn't deployed to production yet. So here, this is a common convention that we use in Builder. We actually have a really cool thing here. Um, so in Builder, we have this cool little UI that I add to a lot of applications. We call it our dev options. I hit a keyboard shortcut to open that up, Control Command A. And if you're authenticated as a super user, like actually a, an employee at Builder, you see some extra options. And what's cool is we have this API env. So what's neat is from the Builder web app, at any point I can say, hey, instead of pointing to the production APIs, point to the development APIs. This just becomes a little setting in local storage. I can clear it out or change it later. So now let's actually refresh this. And now we should access our local host. So let's see. Okay, the URL didn't change, good, authorize. Okay, progress. Okay, localhost 4000 is failing. So we're not getting cores. Let's double check our Figma plugin auth API. We do in theory have cores running and let's make sure the API server is running. It should be right here. Okay. And I'm not sure if I can see, these logs are messy because a lot of requests get sent when this application boots up, but let's double check this. Let's see why in the world, let's see. Let's remind ourselves which methods this takes and we can check in our HTTP client. That energy, <laughs> what do I eat to get that energy? I don't know. I actually don't even drink caffeine, believe that or not. I have lots of thoughts on caffeine, by the way. Um, I used to drink caffeine. I go on and off caffeine. If you go off caffeine for about two months, your energy levels come back to the same as when you're on a decent amount of caffeine. Like obviously if you take a shot right now of espresso, you're gonna have more energy than usual, but actually you have much more consistent energy if you do not take caffeine. Log.txt, oh yeah, that's true. You don't always have to look at your logs in a console. You could output them to a file and dig through it. We don't do that, we probably should do that. I could do that in a bash and have it piped to a file, but that's okay because um, we know what we're doing here and we're gonna test this out. What I'm gonna do for a moment is I'm going to get rid, um, Smoke weed to get 200% more brain power. <laughs> I don't find that. Uh, I am totally okay with weed, but I do not find I get more brain power. I just get relaxed and happy and I sleep. I enjoy sleep a lot. I don't think the sleep quality is better, but I really look forward to sleeping. Um, okay, I'm disabling auth really quickly to make the testing of this a little easier. And let's just test out on our HTTP client if this, this API works at all. Um, let's first start with a git. So for the git request, in theory, okay, I'm getting HTML back. What that means is something's not configured right here. So uh, HTTP 4000 EVA turtle thing with plugin auth. Let's load this in a browser. Yeah, okay. So this is just giving me something that's not what I want. So let's double check if this is configured right. So we've got a firebase.json, and this is where we map all of this uh, auth stuff. There we go. So it looks like this is correct. This should go to fi function Figma plugin off. Let's see, maybe I forgot to run, let's go to our API index.ts. It's very possible I forgot to update our routes. So I'm going to open up Docker and we have a tool using Earthly, which uses Docker that allows us to run scripts in the same type of environment locally as our CI. Docker takes a minute to, to spin up and Docker on Mac for whatever reason, eats like six gigabytes of RAM. I try and have this thing open as briefly as possible. I thought Docker was supposed to be the super lightweight yada yada thing. I have no idea why it eats up so much RAM for me. 
Um, what off service provider would you recommend? The only one I've used, and this is controversial, is um, at least in recent years, is Firebase Auth. And what I like about it a lot is it is connected under the hood to Google Cloud Identity, which is extremely powerful. So when we built the builder product, Firebase Auth was super simple. You could connect all kinds of connectors. When we added a login with GitHub, login with Google, login with email, all that was crazy easy. Um, and I know, and, and one thing I want to make a point of with these streams is I know that there are certain things that you can and can't say on social media. And if I went out on social media and said, Firebase Auth is great, everybody would be like, boo, no, that's not cool. That's not new. Well, you know what? It works freaking great. And it has a really, really great upside is that it's wildly low cost. It really is not expensive. Um, and second, it because it connects to Google Cloud Identity, when we need to add really, really more advanced functionality, like um, single sign-on for our enterprise customers, it was so easy. It was just in there. It was just built in. It was part of Google Cloud Identity, which is what powers Firebase Auth. And so in every case when I've used Firebase, there was always a Google Cloud product that was really easy to, to migrate onto or just instantly adopt when you needed it. So it was a very easy starting point to a full big old enterprise platform. You can't say that with a lot of other tools. There's a lot of tools that are easy to get started. You're gonna to have to migrate off. Firebase to Google Cloud has been so seamless for us. Um, so port 4000, that's that's my concern too, is that port 4000 is not serving what we think. And I think the problem might be that we don't have this API fully hooked up just yet. Um, I think I wrote some of the code here, but I didn't test it. And I probably dropped something. Um, and exactly what Fernando says, people don't like Firebase because it's not new enough. That's what drives me crazy about developer Twitter, developer X, developer social media, is there's cool things to talk about and there's not cool things to talk about. And that's not the reality of life. There are a lot of great, great pieces of software that are not the newest and are not the coolest and they work fantastic. And a lot of times, not going to bug everybody, a lot of people are sharing stuff on, on Twitter, are very popular on Twitter or other social media, YouTube, etc., are not actually sitting down building real production applications every day. There are some, but it definitely feels to me to be in the minority, just given the way people talk, <laughs> just what they talk about and how they talk about it. I'm like, hmm, I'm not entirely sure. One person I have enormous respect for in this regard is Jack Harrington, blue collar caller on YouTube, fantastic. He has been only up until recently started focusing on content full time, but he has a long career in software development, working on real production systems. And so when he tells you his take on things, it's a very, very realistic, very dry, sincere take in a really, really good way. And that's what I'm trying to do more of here too, because I kind of got caught up in the whole soundbite on Twitter world for a while, and it just kind of made me sick over time. And so we're going to talk about not the... Um, most sexy technology here, but we're gonna talk about real technology you're actually probably gonna use and what the trade-offs are. Um, I do also stream on Twitch. I'm Steve8708 on Twitch. And I don't think I have anybody who follows me on Twitch. We can actually go over to Twitch and see. Is anybody, literally zero viewers on Twitch. <laughs> I've got 14 on X and I hear that the stream quality is really low on X. I've got 129 on YouTube right now, zero on Twitch. So if you wanna follow me on Twitch, that'd be cool. It'd be nice to make that number a one sometime. I like YouTube the most because it actually, um, uh, persist the videos over time as well. Um, oh yeah, a lot of people saying that they can't even, I mean, here's the reality too. A lot of these tools people talk about, you can't even use. You might even not be able to use Firebase. That's okay. Use AWS, use Azure, whatever you're going to use. And that's again what we're talking about here. How do we work with production systems with the tools that we're given? I joined a company one time and I was not happy with the tools they used. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to go on a mission to get them to modernize and use all the best tools so we enjoy our jobs. And that was a terrible idea. I don't recommend that whatsoever. Wow, I have two Twitch followers. This is amazing. This is probably my first two Twitch followers ever. Um, the reality is, in most cases, the tool choice doesn't matter that much. There are some cases where the tool choice matters a lot. I, I will admit that. At this company, actually, we were using some very, 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 very legacy things. But I made the mistake of saying, you know, why don't we just change everything? Why don't we just hit reset? Big rewrites to use new tools is almost guaranteed to be the worst idea and the worst project you've ever worked on. The first couple weeks or couple months of the project is probably awesome. And then it goes off a cliff really fast and it sucks and it's horrible and I would not recommend it. The last 20% can go on for years and just be mind numbingly and destroy your inside. Um, let's see. Oh, somebody asking about drag and drop interfaces. Okay, a lot of stuff to answer here, but first thing we have to answer is why is our API not work? 
And so um, because we use Firebase hosting, which has a good routing mechanism between the front end hosting, the HTML and the API, when I went to localhost 4000 in my API route, what I'm actually seeing here is HTML. Um, what I'm really seeing is this is not quite the HTML I anticipated. What is ZE.hide? I don't even know what I'm looking at here. What are we looking at? Oh yeah, yeah, no, this is the builder HTML. It's just compressed. Okay, so it's not serving our API as expected. Either I haven't restarted the server recently, which I don't think is the case. Um, but then it would say, hold on, let's restart this backend really quickly. Something's wrong here. It should be telling me, um, follow up with no video. There's no video on Twitch. Well, that might explain why I have no Twitch um, streamers. Let's see, we're gonna view this on Twitch unauthorized. <laughs> Okay, maybe Twitch isn't working. I'll check out, I'm using a service called Restream to stream across platforms. Streaming doesn't seem to work great on the Twitter slash X platform in terms of quality is what I hear. I mean, let me know in the chat if you disagree. Um, YouTube seems to be the best and most reliable and apparently Twitch isn't working. I'll double check and maybe re-authenticate with Twitch. Maybe that'll fix it. Um, but let's figure out why the world Locos 4000 is not giving us what we expect. So I restarted the server. I am seeing, sometimes when you boot up the server, there we go, cannot get, okay, this is progress. And I think that is correct. We do not have, okay. So maybe I can go ABC123, there we go, works. Sometimes you just gotta restart. I swore that wouldn't be necessary, but it looks like it is. No Twitch video for me either, maybe next stream. Okay, I will try and fix the Twitch streaming next time. And uh, if, you're, if you're having trouble with Twitch, maybe try it on YouTube. Um, <laughs> Twitter is called zitter as in shitter. Yeah, I, I kind of refuse to use the name X for Twitter. It drives me a little bit crazy. Um, I'm sure there's some good things going on there, but the X, uh, it just, I couldn't, I still can't, I still call it Twitter. I'm sorry, everybody, or, or shitter, maybe call it that. I still like going on Twitter and posting these on Twitter, but yeah. Smash like and subscribe. Yes, I should have a little thing go off. Everybody does that. Um, yeah, I so many times in my life I have just needed to hit restart and all my problems would go away. It is crazy. That happened to me the other day. I spent like 30 minutes trying to figure out why I, nobody could hear me in a Discord voice channel. And you know what I had to do? I just had to leave the channel and come back. I tried everything. I was going through every setting, every configuration. That's all it was. So always remember that. I know it's annoying. Restart the computer, restart the application, restart the server. Sometimes that solves all your problems in life. Unless you're on serverless, then funny enough, on serverless, there's no way to reboot server sometimes, which is really annoying because sometimes you actually want to shut down the function instance to get it back up into a good state. Yeah. Um, I am using AirPod Maxes yet. Yeah, I don't know what AirPod Max Micro is. I'm using the original AirPod Maxes. These are stupidly expensive, but they're comfortable and uh, they work pretty well with the Apple ecosystem. I'm back and forth on them, but I, I, I don't know if it's worth the cost, but they certainly are way more comfortable than using um, a lot of other headphones I've used. Um, okay, so our API works. Let's go back and we can add back this auth middleware and let's try our button again. Our Figma plugins have probably already complained. We've timed out, that's fine. Um, I just want to make sure we're able to make an API request successfully. Did I just, yeah, I hit authorize. Okay. Loading. Let's go to the network. I want to find an HTTP request. Here we go. Authentication required. Oh, forgot to pass auth headers. Okay. Which microphone am I using? Um, I'm using a Movo 5000, Movo MV 5000. Hold on. I can find this thing is listed somewhere in my stuff. Movo UM700. Um, hello, how are you, Twilight? Um, that's the microphone I used. It's not an incredible microphone, actually, and I don't hold it close enough to my face. If I was a real legit steamer, I'd have the microphone right here, and apparently that's how you get the best quality, but I'm lazy, and I'm literally in my desk, in my bedroom, uh, in San Francisco, and so microphone's here, but uh, it does pretty good. Okay, so we're able to make requests, but they are not authenticated, so let's fix that. So... Um, so what we could do here is we can say, we have a cool little utility called appstate.user.authheaders. There we go. Cool little builder thing. This is something I built early in the day, which is like, um, if you wanna just have a way to authenticate requests and you don't want to have to, um, let's say the way you do it changes over time. Today you're using authentication bearer, tomorrow you're using something else. We just have this cool little spread, add auth headers to anything, and then we should be good to go. So let's try this again. Can we authorize? everybody? Drum roll, please. Can we get a basic 
HTTP request to fire. And what the heck just happened? Did that just redirect? Did the window close? Oh, the window closed. I know why the window closed. Um, what tools? Oh, what tools do I use to swap between apps? Oh my God, I have this weird screens window. I don't know how to make go away. Um, I use, um, this is another old school to, tool that is not the, um, what? I can't even remember what my keyboard shortcut is for it. I use Alfred. Alfred, I have mapped, I don't even know how to open Alfred. Alfred. In the Alfred application, I created a bunch of custom workflows that allow me to use a keyboard shortcut to open and close apps. So I use this weird convention where on a Mac, Control and Alt combined never really do anything. So I use Control Alt C to open Chrome, X to open VS Code, all kinds of stuff. And then I actually use something called Moom to jump my windows around so I can just pop them in different areas via the keyboard. It's kind of nice, it's kind of handy. Um, anyway, let's actually undo this right here. So in theory, our HTTP request worked. In fact, let's check and see if it did. Actually, I don't know how to check because I don't remember what the ID was, but let's remove this for a minute. We intentionally want to close the window once successful because we're kind of launching a pop-up, we're authenticating, we want to close and get you back to your Figma. But um, that's pretty annoying for debugging. So let's redo this and not have the window automatically close. That certainly took me by surprise. So we're again, we're gonna pop this open Oh, maybe we should launch this as a pop-up too, because actually when you close the window, you just see your other tab and that's confusing. If we launch it as a pop-up, it should close. Hmm. I'm thinking about the UX of this and I'm a little bit concerned that if we close the window our, on ourselves, it's not necessarily gonna do what I thought, which is leave you in the Figma app. It may leave you just in your browser in a different tab in a state of total confusion like I was. <laughs> so maybe that's something we need to rethink, but we'll worry about that in a moment. So let's see if we can get a good HTTP request going. And let's hope for the best. Uh, we're in the network tab. I think this is the one. Uh, nope, as long as there we go. That looks correct. What is the payload? All right, perfect. Private key is foobar. That's what we wanted. All right, my heart stopped for a second. I was like, oh, I don't want to expose the private key to the internet. I can always revoke it, but you know, I'll have to do it quickly. Um, and great. And the ID of this is, um, something I can check in my browser really quickly. So the thought process here is we should be able to post a key by an ID, which is this, and we should be able to retrieve a key by ID. There we go. It works, everybody. And now, in theory, actually did, how about just a page with you're logged in? Yeah, I agree. I think the way the user experience should probably say, hey, you're logged in, all is good. Um, oh, we are also, ah, ah. This almost worked end to end. Hold on, we're in really, really good shape here. Um, we just need to go back. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, what is going on? Hello, 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 hello. Okay, we need to make sure we're using the correct host here. Um, this is not deployed yet, so I have this little use dev utility. So let's say um, const uh, API host equals, let's see if it can Copilot figure it out. I feel like Copilot should be able to figure this out. Okay. Use dev, there we go, but we want localhost 4000, otherwise cdn.builder.io, cool. So now we can go back and say, hey, API host, know that you were streaming on YouTube. Hey, Yaroslav, I was just talking to him in person yesterday. It's really fun when you've talked to somebody through the comments and then suddenly you talk to them on Zoom. Yaroslav was looking at using Builder, uh, our product for their company, and it was really cool, putting a face to a name. It's also funny how people talk one way on, you know, or it can be perceived one way in writing and then a different way kind of like an actual face-to-face -face conversation. I have no idea if somebody only saw what I tweet and comment and how they think I talk versus I actually do. Um, but it's nice to be able to put more of a personality to uh, behind somebody's words. Okay, so now we should be pulling the correct place. And let's see if this works end to end. It is possible that it might. And let's see, got private keys. Let's uh, data private key. Okay, so let's see. So just as a recap, you all saw, I launched a window, approve on that, writes the key information to a backend. Then we pull that backend, and then if we get the right key matched by a public ID, 
then we can move on. And we just tested all the pieces individually, so now we can see if it all comes together. Um, sorry, check in the comments. People talk about Alfred and everything. Okay, so let's go in and turn this into something real. Let's pr everybody pray. What we're gonna do is we're gonna just hit the button. We're gonna launch in here. And we're gonna pray that by hitting authorize here, that's gonna send it to a backend. Actually, I don't know if it's accomplished or not. I think it worked. Let's check the logs. It should say Goth Private Keys Fubar, everybody. We can celebrate. Where's the champagne? <laughs> Everything came together beautifully. And just so you all know, this is how I usually develop at least. I build the pieces and then I see if it works. That's kind of the, the ultimate strategy in my opinion. I know if you read online the blog post, they'll be like, oh, you gotta write the test first, this and that. Like we talked about before, I don't even know if this methodology will work. I don't even know if this is, is the right approach in terms of security, user experience, etc. I just want something to be working to unblock our development. So let's keep going. I'm gonna pop back over here and now we need to handle that UX glitch. So here's the UX problem we have. And this is something that, this may not be something you get to experience at every company, but here's the joy of building your own side project, which could turn into your own company, or it could be something that is just for your own learning is, oh yeah, no good Nick called it exploratory prototyping. Exactly. I'm a huge believer in exploratory prototyping. In my ideal world, let's go to Excalibur really quickly. Here's the way software is usually designed and created. And I hate this approach. I deeply, deeply, deeply hate this approach and everybody wants to do it all the time. If you don't costly advocate for doing it another way, everyone will default to this major, major anti-pattern of waterfall development. And you could say, yeah, we use agile, we use sprints. You're probably still doing waterfall. Waterfall development is somebody makes up what the product should do. Probably a product manager who talked to customers, looked at some data, whatever. The worst case scenario, the thing that drives me the most crazy in the whole world is when they all they looked at was data and decided where the opportunities are. Data is important, but when you only look at data and say like, oh, nobody's clicking this button. You know what we should do? We should just make that button bigger. I hate that. Or like, you know what we should do? We should just add AI to this feature. Let's have AI personalized, blah, 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 blah. Somebody looks at some data and says, I bet I can make this data get better if we do AI, blah, blah, blah. So, okay, great. The feature idea is AI, blah, blah, blah. And then it'll go to some type of specification process. Maybe PM writes a spec. Hopefully the product manager has some technical background of some kind, um, or else they might just make some stuff up that is very highly unrealistic. Something that often goes on in this process, in this kind of step two, is there's no consideration for the technical constraints. So in a younger company, or if you're someone like myself, who I actually originally started my career in product design, and then I, I taught myself development, I dropped out of school and learned to be a, a developer. Um, yeah, user stories, user stories would probably come into this too. But in my case, um, I, I learned one important thing, which is um, building good technology is a marriage between what users need and what technology is efficient or capable of being developed. A lot of people forget the second part and they just say, let's do this. And it's like, okay, if we do that, if we think of that idea in a vacuum and we don't take into account what's possible technically or optimal technically, then we just end up creating this massive scope accidentally. And so you might have an idea. Let's say we turn that into a spec. This might be, in, uh, within these steps might come the form of a user story. Um, certainly you should be thinking about it in terms of what the user needs and that. And then in the common waterfall case, we make the design. Here's the design. Then we may just go straight to development or we may go to, let's have the engineer spec it out. And then we develop. And we hope everything goes as expected. Nothing ever does. This is the waterfall that drives me absolutely crazy. And then in theory, you ship it. We're getting long here. So in theory, we ship it. And then inevitably, and this is an important thing too, nothing is ever successful on first ship, hardly ever. It's very, 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 very rare that the first iteration of anything, especially in this methodology where we dreamed up a perfect world, we have design by committee throughout. We're all just kind of like, oh, I got opinions on this. I got opinions on this, yeah, 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 yeah. And then eventually you ship it and you get, let's call it feedback. That could be in the form of quantitative data or qualitative feedback. And then you go back to the drawing board. You're like, oh, it wasn't quite right. Let's start over. 
A process like this could take months. I'd say this is a two month process and sometimes it's for the simplest thing. It could be the silliest thing. And this is something like our customers even talk to us about. It drives them crazy that all they want to do is add like a button or like, what was it? I can't remember, like a drop down menu to a site. And two months later it's shipped and the users hate it. This is how you create pain. What I like to do is what I love how No Good Nick called it, exploratory prototyping. Let's say first, the big problem I hate about this is this assumes you have a good idea, <laughs> right? Let's assume for a second we don't have a good idea or we don't know if our idea is good. And let's assume for a second that we don't know what are the right sort of technical underpinnings of how to build this correctly. What we're gonna do instead is we're gonna do, I'm gonna keep using this term exploratory prototyping. And so what I prefer is, let's go over here to the left. So we have an idea and we just make a prototype. In doing this, we can learn and do so much. And I think almost any company can benefit from this. This is not like a, oh, you're a startup, so you know you could do that, but a big company can't. A big company can totally do this. A big company just doesn't like to do this because a big company, in my opinion, a large team likes to, everybody wants to prove that they're smart and they know right. And nobody likes to assume that they might be wrong because it doesn't make you look good to convey you might be wrong. Uh, you want to convey confidence. You want to look good to your peers. I hate that so much. Um, oh yeah, and users also hate to, they hate new features. And actually I'll, I'll argue there's a reason why users often tend to hate new features. There are cases where users are just resistant to change. Change is hard. Change takes adaptation, adaptation takes effort and energy. And when all you were trying to do is open up your Facebook posts and now everything's moved, it can be annoying. But there's another reason in my opinion why users tend to hate new features because we're building the features wrong. <laughs> we are assuming what we need out of it. We are assuming what it should look like. We are assuming how we need to build it. We are finding that it took longer to build because we didn't really take the engineering constraints into account. And you could say, oh, well, if you wanna take engineering constraints into account, then we'll add another step in the process. We'll say, hey, let's also have an engineering design discussion. Let's add more committee. We'll have a committee for this. We'll have a committee for this and we'll add more steps. And now we go, we go from here to here and here to here. And that's another kind of plague that I think happens in businesses. It's like, oh, we have a problem. We want to move faster. Let's add more steps. Let's add more process. And now, now it's fixed. No, we just made it worse. We're making it worse every single time. The alternative way, which is what we're doing here right now live, is we're going from idea to prototype. This is going to tell us a few extremely important things. Guaranteed the prototype's going to fail in certain ways. The very first pass we took on this, we failed at the, the way we thought the authentication could work. We thought we could open a pop-up window and communicate back to the parent window, and it turns out that you can't do that. And I bet you, if we had written this up and designed it in this fashion, we wouldn't have found that on the first day. We found that within the first 20 minutes. We would have found it out probably a month and a half in at this step. And then it's like, uh-oh, we got to revise. Do we rev How far up the chain do we go to revise? Or do we just start scrapping these together? So that's where, just like Jim Johnson says, we need to get to an MVP ASAP. And that's where you could call whatever you want. Proof of concept, prototype, MVP, just code something. The way you just code something is you don't worry if it's ugly. We're going to deal with that later. We don't worry if the UX is perfect. We're going to deal with that later. First step is let's get it to just work. It could be ugly, it could be clunky, but let's just get it in our hands. Let's touch it with our hands. Let's run into the technical issues so that by the time we have the prototype, we can say, hey, window.opener, not an option. Can't use that. Polling, we had to use polling. So polling was our solution. That's good to know. Um, we can get some basic code written. We can refactor this later if we need. But most importantly, we can see if it works and we can see if it feels right. And then what I found, when you have an ugly prototype that works and people can use it and you can share it with others and they say, oh, okay, yeah, this works end to end. We understand the technical constraints. We understand the basics of the, say, V0, first version user experience. And then we can actually identify and try it and dog food our own product. Then it's so easy. Well, first I want to draw another arrow here. There's going to be back and forth. As we prototype, we need to revise the idea. Did it not technically work? Let's revise the idea so that it technically works. Did it not feel right? Let's revise the idea so it feels right. Did it not function right? Let's revise the idea so it functions right. Were there unknowns that mean the original idea won't work at all? We need to change the idea entirely to be uh, realistic. And um, these are all the things you can figure out and you can know here now. Now, 
it's really easy. When we get to the stage of ugly prototype that works, then we can make it look nice. Make it. And we've had phenomenal success on having, like we'll have like one developer, just like, hey, you go mess around and see if you can get this idea to sort of work. Not a detailed uh, idea, not a detailed spec, just a, a, a vague idea of where there could be a valuable addition to our platform here. And then when you have this ugly example that you can give to a good product designer, they can come back and say, hey, here's how you can make this look much nicer. We've already vetted, it can work, we know how to make it work, we can make it feel nice, and now we can make it look nice. And then we can ship it to customers. And we can continue to refine and go up and down this. Now, you might want to add some testing and other small tests, but this is what I very much believe in. And this is what we're doing right now. We are doing this right now. We are, I will tell you many times when we were building this Figma plugin, we thought that the way the thing should work or the data should be stored, we thought many, many things. And instead of saying, let's all think about it together, let's talk about it together, let's spec it out together. Instead, we just said, hey, let's build the thing and see what happens. And that's my favorite thing. And I would say I have almost no more joy as a developer than building in the unknowns. And I'm curious what Yaroslav was saying because uh, I've never read the Pragmatic Programmer, but I've always loved the idea because I do feel like a lot of programming advice is very not pragmatic. It's very uh, idealistic. Use this tool, not that tool, you know, because it's better. Use this practice, not that practice, because it's better, right? More tests first rather than, you know, later or whatever. And it's so different. And... Um, yeah, so here's the funny thing too. So there is one question, which is, do you throw away your prototype or do you convert your prototype into production code? This is actually an interesting, um, an interesting sort of debate here. In my opinion, I like to turn prototypes into production code in most cases, but it depends. You know, there are certain times where you actually intentionally want to throw away a prototype because you know you're just going at it in a crazy sloppy way. In my opinion, there's a balance. If you can preserve the prototype and turn it into production grade code, fantastic. If you can't, that's okay too. And I think there's a time and place for each. Um, so let's kind of continue what we're doing. So I forgot, stay focused everybody, we're building something. <laughs> the reason I stream while I'm building stuff is because also I need to build the thing. <laughs> People are waiting on me to deliver this feature. I nominated myself and said, oh, uh, one thing is, you know, I, I built the original code for this entire platform and all of the different repos and features. I, I think I still was the patient zero for almost everything. And um, so I have the rare opportunity of, I know how all the pieces work. And so in many cases, I can yeet out some new thing quickly. If, if somebody's working on something and they might not know how to do the this or the that, I can kind of assist with that. So in this case, we've got our private key and we found that we can do this all successfully. And let's go and let's save this thing. So got private key, oh, that's right. Let's see, we messaged it to the um, code thread for the plugin. So we've got a code process and we've got a UI process. That's how Figma plugins work. And you use basic kind of post message message passing for that. And let's see, what was the name of our, okay, got private key was the name of what we have. And we're gonna Figma client source set async builder private key. Okay, let's actually see if we can retrieve this. So if I'm in the console here, can I do Figma dot, uh, client storage. Can I just access that from the console? I honestly forget. There we go. Dot get async. Let's see if this landed all the way into our storage. And oops, it's async. Let's await. Thank goodness that Chrome starts. For oh, we got FUBAR. Okay, fantastic. So we've got the private key all the way end to end. So in theory, we have a basic working feature. Um, let's see. Vidal asks, how do you, how much do you code as CEO? It's off and on. Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. I really like to when I can. I enjoy it a lot. And in my opinion, we we build products for developers. And so if you want to sit on your high tower and act like you know what developers need and you're not actually writing code yourself for production applications, I think you're being silly. And I think that's a, a, a failure path that I really want to avoid going down. If I have the opportunity to be my own customer and feel for my own customer and I decide, oh, I'm too important, I'm a CEO, I don't need to be a developer anymore. First of all, I love developing. I will do it on the nights or weekends or whatever when I have time to do it, um, especially when I kind of get to do it my way, which I have the privilege of being able to do in, in many cases. Um, and second, um, I just don't like the idea of being out of touch. I don't know if any of you have ever seen that 
uh, somebody creates something and then maybe they build a company around it or maybe they, you know, it gets popular in some ways and that person kind of starts turning into an asshole. Um, that is something I'm deathly afraid of. <laughs> it's something I want to make sure doesn't happen. And I feel like actually getting my hands dirty and coding and working with the tools and the software our team has to work with and working with the standard ways of coding that other people, our customers need to do, keeps me grounded as a human being and humble and honest. And I think that's important personally. So we've got our key and this is good because we have our fake key and we need to fix two things. So we talked about the UX was clunky. Let's try this again and let's add our window.close. Ooh, Yaroslav is saying like, I'm not gonna say yes, but I'm definitely thinking yes. Um, so let's go, um, uh, what do I wanna do? I will say one thing, I have a lot of respect for 37 signals. Um, there's a lot of talk these days about maybe a couple of years ago, all startups need to be as grow fast as possible, throw money at problems. That was definitely what all the VCs were telling you to do. We're not excluded. It was definitely, hey, it's 2021. Why aren't you going faster? How do you spend more money? Spend money, spend money, spend money. These days, we're back to reality, which is how do you build a business efficiently? How do you not waste time and energy on the things that don't matter most and are not most essential to your business? You don't have unlimited time. You don't have unlimited money. And one thing 37 signals where DHH works, the creator of Ruby on Rails, um, creators of Basecamp and Hey.com, and they're making some other interesting products right now. Um, I do not agree with many of their opinions about modern front-end development, so I'll, I'll make that clear. I do not love DHS's style of showing off his like expensive cars and his expensive all his expensive stuff. I do not have an expensive life whatsoever. I live in a tiny apartment in San Francisco. I'm in my bedroom right now. Uh, I am not into fancy things whatsoever. Um, but I will say the way they've run their business, very lean and profitable for a long time, is very interesting. And more businesses today need to study and be like that than ever before, in my opinion. Um, that said, I got beef with, with other opinions of theirs, but that's we'll save that for another time. Um, so... Back here, we really need to refine the UX. Do I do consulting? I don't. I am busy enough as it is. Um, though that could be fun maybe in a future or past life. Um, so we have this issue now where over here in our diagram, when we launch the builder app, it just kind of says it's loading forever. So let's try again. Let's see what happens if we just call window.close. So we launch the pop-up. We allow um, you to click, you know, yes, I approve. And then we just close the window. Andre says, can you invest in the company? Um, if you're a VC, I mean, we we will be raising at some point a series B round, which means we're looking for tens of millions of dollars. So you can invest if you're a large VC fund who has lots of money. Um, but I appreciate the, uh, the, the interest for sure. Okay, so let's try this again. And um, what is the soy looking programming language? Why is it soy looking? This is TypeScript. This is JavaScript with types. And really there's not even much types here. This could be plain old, uh, this could be plain old JavaScript. Um, but anyway, so let's test this out. We're gonna try the button again. We're gonna click login. We're gonna launch into here. We are going to then hit authorize. And then, ah, that's the problem. So the window closes, but we're left not in Figma again. We're left in my other browser tab. DHS has locked on. Um, if DHS was on the stream, uh, well, I would definitely be nicer to DHS if DHS was on the stream. <laughs> I definitely respect the things he's accomplished. He's got some pretty strong opinions, though, that I don't I don't align with, and some of his vibe these days. I have to say, though, old school DHS's vibe was awesome. And it's very similar to the vibe I like, which is like being pragmatic, not idealistic. Old, old Ruby on Rails talks by DHH in my opinion, freaking fantastic. And I, I understand why Ruby on Rails in part got so big. I don't know what caused him to, in my opinion, lose his way a bit, but I hope he finds his way back one day. I don't believe that'll happen, but you know, maybe it will, maybe it will. There's definitely something good in there. There's lots of good in there, in my opinion. Um, so let's try one thing, which is I'm wondering if we, if instead of launching a tab, which when you close the window, it'll go back to your last tab. What if we launched a, a pop-up window? And I'll be honest, I forget the exact syntax for when you do a window.open uh, here, over here, window.open. There's a syntax to say like, it's something like maybe a uh, copilot. Ah, there it is. Of course, copilot will auto-complete it. It can read my mind. Well, if we specify the size of the window, it will launch as a distinct separate window. And maybe slash blank, maybe y'all can remind me, is there a way, what I wanna do is not open this as a new tab, but a fully new window. Maybe slash blank is my, as the window title, I think it's called, is the way to you know launch it as a tab. Maybe there's a different one to do as a window, but maybe this will do it. So let's try this. Um, 
Oh yeah, I have. I have read books by like the CEO of Three Cent Signals podcast. I love a lot of what he has to say. A lot of it is counter to the the VC culture and and um, some of his opinions are really strongly held. And he'll admit sometimes that you know sometimes he just doesn't know what the other world is like. Um, so some of like I, I read the book um, reworked. A lot of good stuff in there. Some wacky opinions in my opinion too. Um, but. Yeah, let's. Uh, uh, but there's definitely a lot of good stuff, and I, I like how they share how they think about their business. And I'm, I'm as you could see, or as you commented, I, I try and do that too, and I'm, I'm enjoying doing that too. We are a business like anybody else. We need to make money. We need to create good products. We can't spend excessively, and it, it creates constraints and challenges, and that's kind of life. Okay, let's just log in. Ah, that didn't change anything. Okay, so it's ignoring my width equals height equals. Let's try ChatGPT for a second. Okay, I. Am writing a uh, let's just do a, a general. Um, I want to launch a pop up window in JavaScript with window.open. And yes, I've been programming for like 15 years and I still don't remember how to do anything in JavaScript. I, I have JavaScript specifically for 15 years. And so I asked Chat GPT everything, and you all should not be afraid or embarrassed to do it either. Um, it is uh, using, I'll say, URL. URL. Let's just see if I'm doing this right. This is a good gut check for it. Am I doing this the right way? Blank. Um, it is opening as a new tab in the the user's current browser, but I want to <laughs> how to send her a div. I want to um, I want to open it as a pop-up window instead. So when I close the window the user will focus on the Figma plugin again. I have a feeling this is just not gonna work because even if you open up a new window and you close the window, still the Chrome app will be focused as opposed to the Figma app. Um, let's see, oh, I could have asked this in Copilot chat. You're right, I, I, I have access to Copilot chat, I don't use it. I will be honest, this is too small. How do I move this? I need the chat to be like here. I need more space. Open session and editor. Oh, there we go, I found it. Let's try that next time. But I pay for ChatGPT too, so whatever. Um, for tabs, I think there was a yeah, there's a pop-up option, right? I was thinking blank is for tabs. So let's see if ChatGPT says it. Um, let's just enter this and see what happens. We can give it feedback. Also, it's getting hot in here. I'm taking my my hoodie off. Don't get too excited. Okay. So window name blank. Oh, maybe I need some of those other options. So it is saying use blank which is what I vaguely recall. Um, pop-up window should, oh yeah, I won't get a reference to the pop-up window. We already found out that that doesn't work as expected in a Figma plugin environment. Understandable, again, when I complain, you know, it's okay to complain about code, but not personally attack the developers behind it. I complain about Figma plugin development, but I actually know they built a phenomenal plugin system and have great developers, so keep that in mind. Okay, let's wait for this to hot reload and let's see if we got something working. Like my giant cup, it's massive. There's just water in here. Okay, did that hot reload? I didn't see it hot reload. I don't trust this. Let me hit save again and see if this launches. There we go, relaunch. That's the worst thing is when you thought something reloaded, you test it out, it doesn't work. You go try and fix your code. Turns out it's not even on the latest code. Okay, it's just not letting me open a pop-up, but I think that's okay. So I think what we need to do is we need to have a, when you're done, say, great, go back to Figma. Now, Here's the big question. Can we deep link back to Figma somehow? You know how sometimes you can click on something and it opens an app? I will admit, after 15 years of development, I don't even know how to do that. That's something I have never had needed to do before. But I would love to do that. Okay, how about this? Let's ask ChatGPT. Let's ask GitHub Copilot, actually. Um, is there a shortcut for this chat? Hello, chat. There we go. I really wish there was a shortcut to open session in editor. Let's try this. Um, I am writing uh, code for a pop-up window in HTML that um, upon confirming, I want to send you back to the Figma app. It's done with special schemas like Figma stuff. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Maybe it knows what the special schema here is. Send you back to the Figma app. How can I link, I link the user back to the Figma native app? Let's see if it knows. It's thinking, okay. Hmm. Yaroslav is right. You can use this. You can use a scheme to specify, okay, Figma file. 
Oof, I don't know the file though. Oh, but actually, hmm. I should be able to get the file ID. I might be able to get the file ID from the Figma plugin. In fact, okay, I am developing a Figma plugin. How can I get the current file ID from the Figma plugin? And I'll be honest, right now, here's an important detail, back in our little diagram here. Right now, I'm afraid I'm starting to bike shed. I'm supposed to be in idea prototype mode and I'm not necessarily trying to think of the perfect way to do everything, yet I'm really getting caught up in the details on how exactly I create the perfect UX for this. I'm most likely, if I don't solve it in the next second, I'm just gonna move on. And I'm just gonna leave a mental note that that UX can improve. And in the short term, I'm just gonna probably leave a message to the user. This is great, go back to Figma. You're good, you're done, you're logged in, go back to Figma. Oh yes, a question is, will this be uploaded to YouTube or elsewhere? Yeah, this will be on YouTube. This whole video will be live on YouTube forever. Okay, so let's see what GitHub Copilot said. Figma.root.id, oh, well this is fun. All right, now this might not work if you're not using the Figma app. So perhaps, do, pick, do plugins even work in the Figma app? Do plugins work in Figma in the browser or only in the Figma app? Notice that I had a, a typo here. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but I have typos a lot and Copilot doesn't care, it figures it out. We're both in the app and the browser version of Figma. Okay, so here's what I'm thinking. The ideal flow here is probably, if you're using the app, when you hit approve, we deep link you back to the app. If you're using the site and we launch the pop-up, we just close the window because the last tab open should be in view and should be the Figma tab. So we're going to need to know for the native app. So let's try this. Okay, in my Figma plugin, how can I know if I'm currently, currently running in the Figma app versus Figma in a web browser tab. Let's see what GitHub Copilot says. Ah, there's no way to know. Okay. However, you can work around to determine the, oh, the user agent. There we go. Oh, it said there's no way, and then they said there's a way. <laughs> oh, I see. We're going to detect if we're running an electron. That's a good idea. It is really cool when AI has good ideas, and especially because you don't have to bother anybody in their work day and you can just do it. Okay, so let's think about how to do this as simply as possible. I wanna send the Figma roots over. Maybe we'll do this. We will send, I have an idea. Um, so from the Figma plugin, uh, so I want figma.root.id. Okay, let's do this. So here in our pop-up, we're gonna get rid of this because that didn't even work. We say is I'll go is Figma is Figma desktop app. Okay, cool. Now I need the ID, and I don't easily have access to this, and I'm trying to think of how I want to pass that through. Figma.root.id will only be accessible. I'm gonna be janky for a second, and I'm going to just I'm gonna hack my way through Figma.root.id. Before I build, wait, 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 that can't be right. Oh, I think. I think GitHub Copilot chat lied. Hold on, hold on. That is definitely not the file ID. And this is common, I find this a lot. Um, uh, one out of every 10 times I ask something to chat GPT, Copilot, et cetera, it just straight up lies. It's the worst kind of liar too. It confidently lies, it hallucinates. And I, this is a really good example of again, why you should just test stuff and not over-architect it. So my first gut instinct here was, I know what to do, I'm gonna architect this. I was thinking, okay, I have to go to the Figma plugin code, I have to message the root ID over, and then I need to um, take that and store it, and then I need to send that to the pop-up, and then I need to send it back. And I was like, you know what, before I build all that, let me just see if I can hard code this, if it works at all. And I assure you, when the deep leaking scheme looks like, where did it go? Where did it go? Oh, do I not have my chat history here? That's a little bit annoying. Um, <laughs> yes, coworkers are confidently wrong all the time as well. Um, yeah, pff, I'm confidently wrong a lot too. I think that's the important part is to recognize you're confidently wrong. That's why I try and tell people a lot too. I'll say, this is why I think the answer is, I very much might be wrong. Like my belief is that, my, my feelings say that's totally the answer, but don't necessarily believe it. Um, that's the hard part if you, you know, are fortunate enough to create a startup and have multiple employees and a CEO of a company of, you know, you know, getting up to like a hundred people. Um, you have to be very careful about what you say. If you say do this or this is how this is, 
people take that as fact. They drop what they're doing. They do the thing. They do it as you said. It becomes ever more important than ever to say, I don't know. This is what I think, but I don't know. And actually, I think that's a good skill for everyone to have all the time. As an engineer, you might think your job is to know things. And the reality, that's not true. Nobody knows things. Your job is to communicate clearly when you know or don't know. And most of the time, you probably don't know. Even if you think you know, you probably don't know. Because everything could change based on context. Now, unfortunately, I don't know how to go to my chat history. Oh, that looks like a history icon. Log. That's not. Where was it that it told me what the URL scheme was for a Figma file? Boop, 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 boop. Oh, there we go. It was this. File D. Yeah. This ID does not at all look like figma.root.id. Um, let's see. Let's try this again. How do I get a file ID for a Figma file so I can deep link to it with, um, let's give it the specific way we do this. Cool. Blam. Good. It is, let's see if it says figma.root.id again. If it does, we're gonna say that's not what it is. You need to open the file figma, look at the URL. Oh, no, 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 I mean in a plugin. I mean in a plugin. I'm in a plugin right now. How now, how do I access this from JavaScript? Let's see. You can't directly access this. Okay, that's the better. Mm. Get file key on message, message.key, what? File.split. Mm. Unfortunately, I definitely know this is not correct. Okay, this is where we time box ourselves and you're like, you know what? We are just prototyping. We're not trying to build a perfect solution right now. We're just gonna bail. By bail, I mean, we're just gonna go over here and in our code, when we are successful, we are going to say we're successful. So I'm gonna store a little piece of state here and I'm going to say um, const success set success uh, equals use state false. Uh, maybe I kind of like the idea of done. Let's do this done, set done. And now, when we are successful, we're going to say set done true. And then if done, doo -doo 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 -doo, we're going to probably do this pretty high up. How about this? Yeah, let's go. We're going to go really janky. And we're going to say, where do I want to do this? Yeah, this kind of wraps that whole UI. So I'm going to say if, mm, or maybe we'll do it here. I'm being indecisive here. There we go. If done, content equals. And by the way, this is a big old nasty anti-pattern. But I bet you the person who wrote this had a good reason for it. So we're actually setting a content variable and based on the different states, we're setting the content in it. This actually, you know what? This is a good example of code that I looked at for a second and it was like, oh, mm, this might not be good. This might not be the way I want to do this. But the reality actually is, this is actually an interesting approach. Oops, my screen might be cut off. I need to make sure I'm not coding at the bottom of the screen because I guess you can't see, uh, you can't see like a couple lines of the screen. Oh, I guess when I'm chatting with GitHub Copilot, you can't quite see what I'm writing. Okay, I'll be careful of that. But anyway, this code is strange. I'm like, why are we setting variables to JSX here? We're, it's like we're, we're technically we're creating little components. Now we don't actually have to do that. These actual function wrappers don't really need to be there. Um, I guess we're calling it for no particularly good reason. Um, but so for a second, I was like, hey, this is bad code. I better refactor this. But the reality is actually, this is kind of interesting because as we all know, conditions in JSX are pretty ugly. You could write these long ternaries and it's very hard to visualize. This approach that was used by, it was created by Manu. Manu is an incredibly prolific developer. He was the one who wrote the majority of the Quick framework, um, has created the Gin framework, worked on Stencil and Ionic, and uh, oh, built the majority of the AI features here at Builder actually too. And actually the pattern he's using is really interesting. Here we can use a standard condition for root level conditions, meaning like the whole UI needs to change based on different states. We can actually define this kind of local content variable and have a nice typical set of nested kind of uh, condition statements as opposed to a big ugly ternary. So well, at first I didn't get this and I was quickly to judge it and I was quick to say, ah, it's not good. Actually, I think it's pretty cool. 
So here I'm gonna be ugly for a second and I'm just going to say, success, head back to Figma to continue. And that's it. This is just a prototype, so I think that's all we need for now. So let's try this again. Does it work end to end? Uh, I hope this hot reloaded, otherwise it might hot reload. Oh, actually, that was our web app we, we just wrote the code to. So we're gonna hit login. We are going to wait for this to load. We are gonna hit authorize. Success, head back to Figma to continue. Head back to Figma and not found, not found, not found, not found. Did that ever succeed? Yeah, it eventually succeeded. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, we got what we wanted, we're all set. And so now we need to handle this state. That login button is in a weird place. And, oh yeah, one comment here. Um, in this case, yeah, the function could return, we could be nicer and say jsx.elements. That's much nicer TypeScript for that function, I agree. Okay, so heading back over here, what we're going to do is we need to, when we are logged in, let's no longer show this login button. So over here, let's go to our app and let's do a couple things. Now the first one is, and this is the really annoying part of needing message passing for everything, is we need to know certain things when this component loads that require a message and a reply to actually get. We have some decent patterns for that, but I really wish we had an easier way to like, um, you know, rather than fire a message and then wait for a message kind of separately, I've written some code before, and maybe I should adapt that to this, where we can pretend a message pack and message pack message passing mechanism actually acts like asynchronous typical code where you can call and get a reply. Um, oh yeah, Jim Johnson pointed out another common way to do this is an object. You have an object of different like states or whatever equations and then you have the React components there. Anyway, so we don't need this Figma desktop app code anymore. What I'll do for now is let's say set success to true. So is logged in set is logged in okay cool actually i like this idea because we can we can work with this so let's go set is logged in true and let's do one other thing is um let's go back and let us go to the code.ts and when we boot up let's send a message here we go we have this init code init somewhere ui init compete yeah there we go is logged in so this is a message we already sent that anyone can listen to when our UI initializes and we can send over, are we logged in? And GitHub Copilot knew a way to check it. This is not a perfect way. Um, oh yeah, we need to add this to the type definition as well. So let's go here, there we go. Is logged in, Boolean. <laughs> Here's a good question. Do we have a UI UX team or do I design your websites uh, ourselves? Um, I used to design the things myself, actually. Um, I used to do good design many, many years ago. I don't do good design anymore. So we actually do have a UI UX team. But what I was talking about earlier is it's surprisingly effective to actually have a prototype and then have a designer make it look nice. So you actually do the design after development has begun. I know this is a huge... Huge controversial thing. Most companies would never do this. You would never design after you start developing. You know what? It actually works incredibly well, especially when I think Google just did more layoffs today. All these tech companies are reducing staff. They have to operate more efficiently. And I think they're finding that they're they're bloated. They, they have bloated processes. They have too many... Um, they're just spending money in the wrong ways. So they have to reduce the spend. So I'm not gonna act like an expert at how Google should operate their business. I don't know how to operate a business that big. But I will tell you one thing, which is... The typical waterfall design process that looks more like this can be wildly more efficient by actually, as weird as it sounds, build before you design. Build, figure out how it needs to work, and then design can be incredible. But anyway, so let's kind of keep going through this. We've made some good progress. We're doing good here. We're saving if the user is logged in. Um, this UI init complete event may actually be fired before our component load, so we need to deal with that. So we probably need to have some type of shared storage here. Um, maybe what I should do, I'm gonna do something kind of wonky here. And again, we're just prototyping. I'm gonna go, thing, oh, how do I do it? I think it's, hold on, add event listener. I think it's just a window event listener we need. Yeah, cool. So I need to run some code 
before, and what is, hold on, on window message, where was that? On window message, what does the type interface look like for this? There we go. Let's do this. Let's steal some of this code. Let's port it over here. There we go. And I'm just gonna do this. Let user is logged in equals false. We'll just save this in a nice little local variable. This could be seen as an anti-pattern, but it's actually less of a problem than it might appear. Let's import this. And we want to do uh, init UI init complete. And we want to set user is logged in equals message that is logged in. Cool. Okay. Um, why are we unhappy with this? Oh, let's just, let's actually do this. Let us say Boolean. If it's undefined for whatever reason, we'll just assume it's not. We are not logged in. And then we're going to do add, what was it? Add event listener message on Figma message. Beautiful. Okay, cool. So now what we can do is when this loads, we can make sure to capture that message if the user's logged in or not. So we can save that locally. Here I will say user is logged in. So we'll set that state by default and then set is logged in true. So if they were not logged in and we logged them in, great. And then if is logged in, then for now, we actually just don't need this button at all. So um, and I actually have an idea for you is logged in and there we go. There we go. There we go. There we go. Now I actually have an interesting predicament here that I'll get to in a second. Wait, 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 wait. Boom, 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 boom. There we go. It's my React apps. There we go. Then should they be HS? Okay. So now in theory, we can know automatically if the user's logged in. So let's check this really quickly. I should be considered logged in and I should be able to, ah, I am not considered logged in. Let's see why. So let's debug this. Do we even get this message? Let's see, console.log got Figma message. Let's just log the message. So let's see if this is logging on boot up. User is logged in, cool. Maybe there's a delay here. Maybe I need to use proper reactivity. That was actually gonna be the next step regardless. So let's see if that's going on. Got Figma message, UI init complete. Users logged in true. Load this component. Okay, that's interesting. So let's log this. Console.log is logged in, is logged in. Now it's possible actually. Oh, ha ha ha. I think that's the bug. Everything was working fine. I just had a wrong, yep, Leonard caught it too. This is the thing, man. This is why you gotta just not overthink stuff. There we go. You just gotta code it, test it. Awesome, I'm glad. I was about to build out this whole, I was like, oh, it must be the reactivity. I need to make sure I have a whole message-based reactivity, blah, blah, blah. Nope, it was just a poor Boolean operator. Okay, beautiful. Now we get to do the fun part. Now we get to do the part that was actually the sort of intention of this stream in the first place, which is now that we're authenticated, we got the token, we're logged in, all this stuff. Now we need to be able to read and write that to a backend. So I wanna make sure that when we need to have access to the data of, um, we wanna have access to the data. So we're now, now we finally have a state where we can say the user's logged in, we have a token, and we can send that token to a backend to authenticate requests. So we can privately read and write data. So let's actually do something with that. Let's actually, I'm trying to think of how we wanna prototype this. I'm thinking what we might do is we might just save like a number or something. Something we can see, verify it's reading and writing and be happy about that. Let's go back to our code and this works. I might refactor this later. I might wanna put a comment of like, what the heck is going on here? This is very unusual to have just kind of initialization, initialization code outside of a component. Now the reason again was because we actually need this message to be caught before this component loads and a way to do that is to put it outside the component entirely. A non-normal practice, but necessary in this case. Could be refactored to another file. We'll think about the perfect structure. And this is actually, ha, this is another important point I want to make. We often think we know the perfect structure of code before we write the code. 
But then we figure out as we go that the way we thought we could solve the problem is actually different than the way we actually solve the problem. And so I like to not refactor code until we get to the very end or very close to the very end. Because we may find out later that this whole approach was bunk anyway. There's some other reason why it won't work at all. Or we might find that this needs to be shared and we didn't think about that. So while I could think about in its current state of what I currently know how I could refactor it, it doesn't mean it's actually the right final solution because I still don't know. I still have not tested this end to end. Once we have a complete end to end solution that we're happy about here, then we can go back and confidently refactor and know exactly what we needed out of this um, and we can do it right. We can make sure we, uh, we've addressed everything. In my opinion, you know everything that needs to be addressed at the very tail end of development, whereas I feel like many people's intuition is to expect they know everything that must be addressed at the beginning. And that, in my opinion, is very, very um, um, overconfident. It's best, weirdly enough, to be underconfident until you get to the end. And now you're like, okay, let me clean up this code. The best time in my time, in my opinion, to clean up the code is when you're sending the pull request. I generally will push my code up. I will look at the pull request UI and I'll ask myself, how would I review this code? What here is really, really, <laughs> what's wrong with this? And that's where you're like, okay, now that I see all the pieces, that's where you can see how to organize it all in a way that you should expect your code reviewer to actually um, approve of. Okay, so let's go and let's actually start making some authenticated requests. So um, I'm just gonna, for now, I'm just gonna make another dummy button and say, if we are logged in, I'm going to make a new button. I wonder what Copilot thinks it'll be. Funny, oh, log out, haha. <laughs> That's something we'll need to do at some point too, but we're not gonna worry about that yet. Actually, this is not the worst idea because logging out will allow you to log in with a different account. You can have multiple accounts in multiple spaces. So actually, let's keep the log it out button. Let's make it, um, uh, let's just make it text, variant equals text. Cool. And I don't even think we have the pipe color. And we need to log out. Uh, let's do this. So let's implement log out really quickly. This will be extremely simple. All we need to do is twofold. One is we need to create a message um, type. We make all our message passing type safe by making what I'll show you. <coughs> Excuse me. This giant discriminated union. And uh, discriminated unions of TypeScript are awesome. They're very powerful. TypeScript compiler is very smart. And we're gonna make a log log out message. I never know if the O should be capitalized or not. What did the AI think? It put it all lowercase, so let's do that. And this is very simple. We're gonna say type log out message equals type log out. Cool, that's our message interface. Now we're gonna consume that in this big switch, case log out. It's all type safe. Thank goodness. Refactoring now is easy as well. I always add the break after I create a case because I've been bit by that way too many times. And now we're just going to delete. Is there a delete? Delete async. There we go. Cool. We're just going to delete the key. And oh, let's do one other thing. Let's set. Okay, it's there. Set is logged in false. Cool. So you should be able to log out, log back in. That's good. But now let's make another button. This is purely for prototyping purposes. Is logged in. And let's go button. And I'm just going to say on click equals. And this is where we're going to start doing stuff. I'm going to call it the do stuff button. <laughs> um, oh, question was why is it the logout message when there is no message field? Well, what I'm doing here is I just need to pass a message to another process that just identifies what the action is. This is a lot like how Redux works, where we're just gonna give it uh, some type of identifier, a name, a type, whatever. This is a lot like sending an HTTP delete request. If you've never done it, delete requests in most cases cannot have a body because you're just saying delete this thing. There's no other information that you need to send. So in this case, logout is all we need to know. Um, in other cases, we might set additional sort of um, uh, information to pass. Like there's another case where we send other messages, post plugin message here. We actually have to send some stuff. This we're just saying log out and be done with it. We'll test this in a minute. So here's where we want to start sending authenticated requests. Oh, and also I forgot. We also need the private key. So let's actually do something else. We're going to be ugly for now and set, let's say builder private key equals 
um, an empty string just for nice. Yeah, I'm treating it as an action type, exactly. So I also need to know builder private key equals message private key. Now this message, there's our beautiful types APT. It doesn't have a private key. So let's actually, let's do two things actually. Now that we know we need the private key, if you remember right, the way we calculate if you're logged in is if the private key is available. So instead, I'm actually just going to go here and I'm going to say logged in equals Boolean. Do we have the private key? And now I'm going to change the type UI init. UI init. What was it? There it is. Instead of is logged in, I'm going to say uh, builder private key string. Uh, very cool. And now we are going to just send the private key. Another thing I should really do is stop reusing this string. So I'm going to export that in a moment. Um, <laughs> um, so I am going to instead set this. And this is driving me crazy that we're reusing the string so much. We have no type safety on this. So let's do, um, let's go to the top here and let's say export const builder private key. Um, client storage ID equals build private key. And now we can start refactoring code to use this instead. So I don't want to hard code the string over and over. I might want to change it later. Let's find builder private key. Let's take all of these instances where we're passing it to something and we're going to use that. Oops, sorry. We are going to use boom, 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 boom. Uh oh, uh oh. Do, 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 do. Where is it? Where is it? I don't know why I won't scroll back to where I want. There we go. Build a private key store ID. Okay, long but functional. And here we want to call this the builder private key. Okay, good. That looks nice. And build a private key. Good. Build a private key. Oops, we called it builder private key. Type safety again for the win. This is why TypeScript so awesome, by the way. These all would have been runtime bugs I would have to deal with. This is why I cannot stand writing Python or Ruby or anything these days. I need types. Sorry, if, if you're going to do like this kind of, um, you know, maybe if you develop this way, you don't need types. You design everything in advance. You test everything in advance, all this stuff. But if you're going to write and prototype and iterate, my goodness, I don't want to have to find all these bugs at runtime. I am going to want to find them. Um, at compile time. Saves me a lot of time. For now, let's say this is string or null equals null. And I'll say this is build private key or null. Let's do it that way. We'll use that null coalescing operator, nice and fancy. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, in my opinion, some people really complain TypeScript makes it move slowly. I move a lot faster because TypeScript. Sometimes, I mean, I weirdly, I enjoy TypeScript. I enjoy types and type systems. I like it because it's a very simple, lightweight, low lift one. You can get as much out of it as you want or, or um, use it as little as you want. But anytime I opt out and use any, the any type, oof, I pay for it later and I, my, I hurt later. My life hurts later. Okay. So, okay, we've got it. So we've got the private key, excellent. So now we can start using this and let's also do one other thing. Const private key, set private key. Cause we, this also might change. And there we go. And then if we are successful here, we're also gonna say, I bet you it'll figure it out. Come on, Copilot, you got it, you got it, you got it. It's not doing it. Come on, this one's easy. It's an easy one. Set private key data to private key, come on. There we go. Uh, why did it, oh, there we go. Okay, it added an import that shouldn't have. Okay, now we're gonna use the private key and we're gonna make an HTTP request. Every time we click do stuff, we are going to not post public message. We're gonna make an API request. Um, what was our, okay, we've got API host. And now we can start actually utilizing something interesting. So const res equals await. Oh, but I wish the errors were better. Oh, I agree with that. I wish TypeScript errors were better as well. I saw a good meme today. It was that meme where there's a hand sticking out of water because somebody's drowning, and it, and it was um, and then the person just kind of high fives it and lets them drown. And the high fiver was TypeScript. <laughs> it's just like here's your problem. Good luck drown. <laughs> um, I thought that was pretty funny. Okay, so here's where we're gonna do the cool stuff. So we don't want to pull it off. We want our KV endpoint. 
we're making our own KV service. The the team internally at Builder was joking that it's a gonna offer a new KV product, seems to be the hot thing. Now we're not actually doing that, but we are creating an internal KV service. This has to do with my philosophy of making your, your APIs really, really light and simple. Anytime we wanna read and write new data from the Figma plugin, I don't wanna to have to build a new API. I don't wanna to have to extend the API with new parameters. This is another example of, oh my goodness, at my last job, we did everything like this. And it was like, oh, okay, yeah, if you wanna to write to a backend, you gotta make a new API. You gotta tell the backend all the schema, all the params, all that. It's like, no, can you not just create a general purpose kind of read and write, save data, read, write, and um, query data API. Whereas the front end needs change, I can just change how I'm calling the API, how I'm saving and how I'm requesting data. I don't need to actually go back and update the front end, the back end, the front end, the back end, because you gotta deploy the front end, back end separately, blah. I just want very simple general purpose APIs that we can iterate quickly on. Because if you're doing this methodology, idea prototype, and then once, and this could go many times before you have the big green light, like, okay, it looks good. And now you design, I would say you also clean up the code and then ship. And then most importantly, you're still gonna iterate, right? Your user's gonna give you feedback and you're gonna come back here. We want this to be as fast of a loop as possible to make the best product possible. With the limited resources we have, everybody's got limited resources. I don't care if you have a million developers, guess what people in giant teams, giant companies still feel like? They still feel like they need more developers because they still got more stuff to do and they wanna move faster. And more developers is not always the faster way. It is working smarter, working leaner, working in a more prototype driven way as opposed to a more waterfall driven way can make a huge difference in my opinion, in my experience. Um, so here, we don't want the private key here. Actually, we're gonna decide, we're gonna make up something. We're gonna say, um, oh yeah, and we want everybody's data to be separated by their account. Yeah, okay. Now, we're gonna make a new API. Um, oh yeah, Excalibur Draw is a great tool. That's what I'm using for all these drawings. I don't know why I'm using red right now. Red is my least favorite color. Let's make it white. I just make it simple. Now, when we do fun stuff like this check mark, Ah, that's better, that's fun, that feels nice to me. And we can get even fancier, because I'm neurotic, ooh, that's nice. That kind of separates what the style of thing is, represents what type of thing it is. More intuitive to the eyes, in my opinion. Um, okay, so now let's make an API. We have a key, we can authenticate, now let's actually send data to the API and read and write. So let's make this API real quick. What I'm going to do is I have this basic API that I made called KV. And I'm thinking I'm going to extend this API. So um, <laughs> I'm a graphic designer too. Um, so this API, I am going to, um, so currently we have this API that I just made for prototyping purposes. There's a general KV API, read and write key value pairs. Easy, easy, easy. Now I wanna make this authenticated and I wanna do a couple interesting things with it. But I also don't wanna break the work the team's doing already. So I have an important decision to make. I'm thinking maybe I make a new API, though I do like the name of this. KV is nice and simple. Um, maybe what we do is, yeah, I have an idea. If you use the, yeah, 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 I have an idea. So this is the simplest thing in the world. You can get, put, and delete something by ID, and it can be anything you want. So send an ID, get the data. Now, I wanna make an authenticated version of this. So I'm gonna add a middleware here, app.use, um, validate, I forget, there, we already have a um, validate user auth, validate user auth, oh, validate, I swear it's called validate user auth, auth. What is it? Somewhere in this repo we have some type of auth validation, hold on, let me think. We have these write APIs, these write APIs handle validation, how are they doing it? Let's see. Um, there's a place where we check for a private key. How do we do these checks again? I don't want to rewrite this logic. I want to reuse it, but I don't remember what the heck we do. I have been, I haven't used this middleware in a little while. So we're gonna, we need to check if you're authenticated. Validate authorization. There it is. Boom. Okay, let's do that. Now I swear we had this in a middleware. Where else do we use this? I swear we, we've made a, a middleware about this API. Validate, yeah, exactly, validate authorization. Do we have this in a middleware anywhere? I mean, I guess we can make our own middleware. 
Why don't we do that if we have no pre-built middleware for this? I think we have a folder for our middleware. Firebase auth, we have cores. Cool, okay. So I'm just reminding myself, this is how I navigate production code bases, by the way. I just search stuff. <laughs> so anyway, here's our middleware. We have cores. Request requires auth. Oh, that's interesting. Ah, validate authorization. There we go. That's what we want. That's what we want. Requires auth. Cool. Beautiful. I knew it. I knew we shouldn't make our own. And let's go back to our, what were we even doing? Okay. Requires auth. Okay. So here's our temporary public um, um, KV endpoints. And now we're going to make the private versions. And we're going to um, distinguish them by having a um, space ID followed by an ID. So now we're namespacing everything to your account, essentially. Um, so we're saying when you're writing a certain key, it doesn't have to be globally unique. It can be unique just to your account. So that's nice. Um, and we can replicate the delete get put, yeah. Okay, and let's do const um, auth collection equals auth to kv, is that what I'm gonna call it? Um, auth kv, I'm gonna call that for now. Yeah, you know, I'm torn on this because this is getting ugly and part of me wants to just break this API um, and make it auth all the time. Let's let's do this, let's do it ugly for now and we can refactor it uh, later. In fact, doing things the ugly way allows us to later do it cleaner because I'll, de I'll probably deploy a test of the ugly way, then we'll stop using the old way, the public way, which was a, a brief hack just for our own development purposes. And then when we find out the better way, we'll find out flaws with this, well, now that we've deleted the original way, which used some better names, we can reuse those names and do it the right way there. So that's something where it's like, hey, we don't got to overthink it. So I'm going to call this auth collection. And we're going to do, um, what is git doc? Git doc is db collection collection. Okay. Let's do, let's just make a function here. Async function git auth, auth doc. I'm, I'm happy with that. Cool. Beautiful. Do we have a set? Great. So now, after, so keep in mind, express middlewares run in sequence. So if we want these to be unauthenticated, they live above. Some global middleware like cores and request logging is at the very top. It always runs. And now for these, we get auth doc. And I'm going to say the ID of these docs should really contain the um, space IDs. I'm going to say const ID equals um let's join these things so let's say rec dot space uh params dot space id i wish this was typed for the record by the way i have never found a express like framework that has type safety from when you create route params forwarding it to the params here and i feel like with typescript's recent string typing developments matt pocock would probably know this best there's probably a way to do this. There's probably a way somehow to actually make it so that these are type safe. But I don't know how to do that yet, so I'm not going to worry about it. I'll join these with a colon. There we go. So we're going to make we're a simple KV service where from our Figma plugin, we can write and read data. We'll generate the ID. Um, Tans.Grouter, yeah. Tans.Grouter might, but I want it on the back end. Like I explored. Um, there's TRPC. Yeah, that's probably more advanced. Does Nest.js do it? That would be interesting. There's also the thing by the Nuxt team that Fireship actually recently talked about, which also wasn't, it was very lightweight and simple, but it wasn't type safe the way I want. I bet you if Tanner Lindsay wrote his own backend framework, it definitely would have this feature because he's all about type safety. But anyway, so we're going to get auth doc, we're going to get this ID, and we're going to send it. Cool. And now to put, we're going to, let's actually, um, get rid of this. Oh, let's do the delete first. Delete is super easy. I bet you GitHub Copilot could just, nope, it is not. Um, wait, 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 wait. What the heck's going on? Why is there two gets? Get out of here. Do I have two gets above? Get, put, nope, okay. Who knows why that was there? Okay, let's like Copilot. This just feels like something Copilot could just do for us. There we go. Hey, that worked. 
Um, why does it know that space ID doesn't exist? What the hell? Am I crazy? I mean, it's not in the URL. That's for sure. Wait, 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 wait. What the hell? I was just talking about how I wish this existed. Does this exist? Am I crazy? Foobar. What the hell? But pr apparently this feature already exists. Maybe somebody updated the Express.js types to have this. I swore this didn't exist. All right, anyway, never mind. Everybody, the thing I just said I wanted, it exists. And it's right here in front of me, right in front of my face, and I had no idea. That is probably the happiest conclusion. This is going to keep me up at night on how I didn't know this. <laughs> anyway. Okay, we're going to delete. Delete works. Okay, now put. Let's see if we can figure out put. I bet it will. It's very simple crud stuff. Okay. Nope, this is not right. Oh, but I should fix this URL so that it knows. That's wild that TypeScript can do that, by the way. It can break apart these, like, um... Oh, KV stands for key value. So we're just a key value store. Oh, here we go. Auth collection. We're always using the auth, get auth doc, auth collection. Cool, 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 cool. Great. I think this works. I think, in theory, we can read and write to this with the space ID and everything. Um, now, one thing I'm realizing is I need to make sure that I have the space ID here. So I realized when I'm saving the user's private key, I'm not saving other information like their space ID, but I really should. I will actually need that to be able to make these requests. So that's a mental note that I need to do. And then I also need to, once I have that, I need to pass to the request. Now, something I should have mentioned. Aha, any unit tests, we'll get to that. I have an interesting opinion on unit testing though. Um, so I have a meeting that I have to go to in five minutes. So why don't we pause here? I'll answer a couple questions and then we can go and maybe, ooh, not later today, tomorrow, I think we can finish this feature. I have streamed several streams. It is crazy, by the way. What seems like a simple feature takes serious time to develop. I mean, obviously I'm ranting and I'm going on side topics and stuff and we're, we're hanging out here. But, you know, what, what you would think would only take a minute takes a little bit of time. Now, I hope by tomorrow we will have this feature completed, which would be great. And then we can actually pass it off to Adam and Manu, who are now using the authentication to build the whole component mapping and the code export. Um, yes, you can go to bed now if you want. Um, but a couple comments to answer a couple of things in the chat. Um, let's see. Um, <laughs> Brandon, you were late. Um, so let's see. For state and react, I use MobX religiously. Huge, huge fan of MobX. MobX works like SolidJS reactivity, quick reactivity, view reactivity. In my opinion, the thing React does the worst is reactivity, which is crazy because of the name. And there's so much better. MobX is incredible. It's underrated and it is incredible. And it's it basically the idea of signals that are so popular. MobX has been doing it the whole time. Um, let's see. I 100% agree with the Scots Mav who says unit tests are really good when you have to refactor code with confidence. You write tests on the current code, you rewrite the code. In my opinion, UI unit testing, you know, testing is hard. There's some times where it makes perfect sense to test. Let's take an open source library that is a bunch of functions that you call and get, you know, uh, results back. And um, that is very straightforward to write unit tests for. For some of the stuff I'm writing now, which is jumping through multiple projects and multiple APIs, the overhead to write tests for this would be significant and the benefit would probably be minimal, especially because we don't know the final expected output of this feature just yet. Now that said, I'm a huge fan of minimal integration testing. So yeah, EDE testing is essential. You know, I'll take a simple example. We have, in Builder, we have this thing called our fiddle. It's not something that the day-to-day -day user uses all the time, but it's something where you can create public links that are shareable of content you've created in Builder. A design you imported where you can grab the code as an export, a, a mock-up you've created or a prototype you've created visually in Builder. And you know what would happen every like couple months? It would just be broken, nobody knows. All the fiddle links were broken. Somehow we didn't hear about it, nobody knew. And so that's where a simple example. One basic end-to-end -end test of load the fiddle, did it load, yes or no, saved us <laughs> a lot. So, um, you know, there's a couple philosophies here. 
you could definitely go heavy and writing test early to make sure you write really clean code with the clean inputs and outputs, especially, especially, especially when you already know the end result. So this is where I'd say in this diagram here, once we get a complete prototype, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to accomplish the complete prototype so we can validate this feature works. Adam and Manu who are working on the consumption side of this feature can be unblocked. Then we can worry about the best possible design. We can worry about um, testing. Let's make sure we add some tests. We can do these things in parallel, which is the beauty of it. And we can refactor. So let's say we can just clean up. This is really the cleanup phase. I'll just make it simple, let's call it cleanup. We're going to clean up the design. We're going to clean up the code. Uh, anywhere that makes sense to add tests, we're going to add the tests, and then we can ship the thing. I don't want to always write too many tests because it can add rigidity, and we know this is still a young feature. The young feature is still going to go through some refinements before we call it perfect, right? Even if we ship it to end customers, private beta testers or end customers, we're still going to be making tweaks. And so certain areas are guaranteed not to change. I would say uh, <clears throat> a simple example of that. I'm not sure if you write some utility functions that can check some um, you know, manipulation of data. Yeah, test that, that ain't gonna change. But some of these user flows, I'm not gonna test it just yet. I'm not even gonna necessarily test it before it goes to production because we actually want user feedback before we call it a mature feature. And a mature feature can then go from a mature feature to what I think the final state is, which is an essential feature. And essential features are the ones that, oh my God, yes, please test those. Let's not always assume every new feature will become an essential feature. But in the case of Builder, essential features, the features that everyone uses every single day, they don't change anymore and they are essential to the product working as expected. Oh my God, yes, please test those. That is so important and that'll save you so many headaches. And that can be, I would generally start with integration tests. Let's test the end to end and let's break it down deeper. Now, essential features for an open source project might be all the features. So an open source project, I would say our test coverage of our open source projects is drastically higher than the average of the, um, the core product and platform. But anyway, all that stuff said, I appreciate all the thoughts and commentary. I've got to run and wrap the video for now. I hope it was helpful watching and participating with me on breaking down a feature into its parts. We dealt with different plugin environments, backend environments, how we're going to authenticate that. And then hopefully we have the end-to-end -end feature here soon enough. Thank you all for tuning in. This video will live on in perpetuity on YouTube. I'll throw up a thumbnail one of these days. And I hope to stream again soon, maybe as soon as tomorrow. Thanks again, y'all. See ya.